it is I, Chaw of the Ohio Boys. I am joined today by Zach and our buddy Dakota. How's it going? How's it going, Dakota? Oh, it's going. We are going to talk about, I'd say the podcast I'm probably most excited about, uh, duck hunting. Yes, waterfowl. Yes. Um, yeah, duck hunting. <laughs> it is the most, I would say it's easily probably the most non-accessible type of hunting most average people. I think that's fair to say. Duck hunting requires a lot of money, a lot of patience, and you just got to know where they're at. It's not now, like deer hunting. Me, I'm more of a deer and turkey guy, so obviously with Chaw and Dakota here, you know, they're going to take over talking about the duck hunting. I'll be completely honest, I don't know hardly anything about it. I can barely blow a call to save my life. But, um, you know, we have some topics that we're going to go over today. Uh, hopefully you guys find it interesting and, you know, maybe it might help you guys out. Maybe it might want to get you guys started into a different kind of hunting. So um, Might not. Might not, yeah. <laughs> you know, like not. Charles said it. It's expensive, Dakota. He knows it's it's very expensive. It's, it's nice. For nice things, it's expensive. You can do it on a budget, but you're not going to be very successful. Yeah, it's 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 pretty tough. So I guess let's start out with how did you guys get into it? Oh man. Well, Dakota, I guess we'll start with you here, being the the guest on the podcast. Yeah. Introduce yourself. Um, and, uh, so I'm Dakota Loop. Um, I've been duck hunting. I think this is my fourth, going to be my fourth full season of duck hunting. Um, I got into it actually, so I went to Hocken College for natural resource law enforcement. Um, one of my friends down there, uh, PJ, was actually the one to get me into duck hunting. He took me out on my first goose hunt. Well, I don't really call it a goose hunt. We were kind of sitting in his backyard waiting for geese to fly over, so it wasn't really much of a hunt, but. As soon as I shot my first goose, man, I just I fell in love with it, and then uh, ever since then I've been adding to my duck my duck decoy collection and trying to get out there and get after them. Um, started out mainly just kind of hunting around Grafton is where I'm from, so a lot of mallards, cornfields, stuff like that. Didn't do the greatest, and then kind of started finding some public land and and going out to more of the western part of the state where the we have our bays um sandusky bay is mainly the one i hunt i've also heard uh maumee is pretty good as well i haven't made it out that far but sandusky and, bay is basically where where i do most of my hunting at and the hunts that you primarily do which you know i've been on hunts with you as well they're drawings yeah correct. so ohio puts most of Ohio's duck property, at least in the western part of the state, is um, they're drawing hunts or controlled hunts. Uh, so it's trying to give people the uh, the opportunity, more people the opportunity to go out and, and hunt ducks because, as everybody knows, it's hard to find hunt permission places, and especially if it's good. That means if it's good, somebody else has probably already have it, so you either have to get in with them or hopefully you just know the guy pretty well and he lets you come out and hunt so, so. just like hunting anything else yeah if it's, it's good people's it is gonna be there. it is but i guess it's different with deer because if it's a good duck spot like say you got a farmer with a bunch of corn fields and there's just geese mm -hmm. and duck piling in on it you know deer may hide themselves in the woods where not everybody's going to know there's a crap ton of deer out there right and that, but if there's a field that's just getting tore up everybody that drives by is seeing that you got all the locals that are already, you know, hunters themselves, and it's just, you got so many things against you just trying to get into a place that's good. I mean, I've spent years building relationships with the farmers around where, we're at, where I'm at, you know, just stopping by, talking to them each year, asking them how they're doing just to even, you know, consistently get a place to right. go each year. Um, and I'll talk about it, you know, a couple years ago. Uh, we had a hunt that it was it was just weird. We worked so hard to get there. Um, ended up getting there um, two, three hours before we even sun up. I mean, it was 20 below. We did all this work, then somebody else shows up. And, you know, they got permission to, so you got to battle that out, you know. So it, it's it's just, it's tough. So how did you get into it, Chaw? <sighs> I mean, I'm, I mean, I think everybody knows by now. Primarily, I grew up on deer and turkey. Um you know, I'm a huge bow guy. Um, in one year, I think uh, I watched a Duck Commander video or whatever, like a lot of people you see, 
you know, people killing hundreds of ducks a year, killing lemmas, you know, the beards, the camouflage, the guns. probably fun, a lot of fun uh, to Yeah, get you're looking at that and you're like, oh man, you know, I can I can get behind something like that. And uh, so, you, you know, I went to Bass Pro and I think I bought six redhead Mallard Drake floaters and a Duck Commander plastic, which seized up every time it got above 32. And it, it was just the crappiest equipment. I had, I mean, redhead waders that leaked from day one. I mean, it was just horrible. And I went to a place called Rest Haven. I'm up where I'm at. It's a public marsh, and it is, yeah, it's it's a nightmare if you're trying to decoy ducks and kill ducks because everybody sky busts. And I didn't know any better. I sky busted when I first started. I didn't know how to call. I didn't know any of that. Um, my first duck hunt, I actually drug my dad out to the marsh with my little brother. And uh, I think we only went 50 yards from the boat ramp, sat down with <laughs> some cattails, threw a couple decoys out, and uh, yeah, it was a nightmare. And my dad's like, well, this is ridiculous. You know, we're freezing out here. You ain't killed nothing. You spent all this money. And I mean, you know, I'll kind of put it into perspective. I know Dakota knows this, but you got two stamps you got to purchase here in Ohio to duck hunt on top of your regular hunting license. So that's expensive. Um, on top of that, you know, I think for... If you want six good duck decoys, you're going to spend probably 70, 80 bucks for just a half dozen. Um, you know, and you usually want to run at least three dozen, two to three dozen, I'd say is, you know, the smallest I like to operate in. Goose decoys, six goose decoys that are good can run you up to $300. I mean, just putting in perspective mm -hmm. how expensive the gear is. And it is, it's not, it's not economical. If you're looking to find a kind of hunting to, you know, get some cheaper meat and provide for the family, duck hunting isn't what you want to do. <laughs> you want to grab a deer tag and go shoot a deer. Um, yeah, so field, so hunting the, the duck fields are probably has the most expensive because even a six-pack of mallards is 130 mm -hmm. bucks, at least $100. Um, and then if you get full-body goose decoys, um, you're looking at 250 easily, upwards easy. of 300 Yep. Yeah. Um, not to say that you can't go out with a 870 and a six pack of decoys, but if you're going to do that, the main thing is you have to be where the ducks want to be. Because yeah, you ain't calling them over to somebody else. So you, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you have an 870, a pair of waders, and six float mallards, you're not going to kill ducks. But if you're going to do it like that, you got to get out there and put the miles on the feet and get out there and scout, see where the birds are wanting to go. Oh, yeah. Find the public land that nobody goes to. Find the private land that maybe you're only the one that's able to hunt or somebody's farm pond. Um, and Ohio is not a big flyway for ducks. It's not, no. We catch, we catch the Mississippi flyway a little bit, and we're kind of right in the middle of two flyways, but the major part of the flyways are not in Ohio. So Ohio's gonna, not really a duck state. Yeah, it's not really a duck state. The only, I don't Really, the only reason why it's even remotely good is because we got Lake Erie and a lot of ducks come down through Lake Erie. Yep. But typically, Ohio is not known for everybody going out there and shooting limits all the time, and <clears throat> not really not known for waterfowl hunters. I mean, most of the drawlings that I go to, I kind of see the same people, yeah. and most of them are fifty year old. And then there's not a lot of young. Yeah, kids yet, exactly. Yeah. There's like there's some kids that's my age, but most of the time it's fifty, sixty year old guys, and they're all hunting together. And Still keep once the yeah, alive. once they stop stop going, I mean, it's going to be it's it's. It's going to be tough because we're going to lose a lot of money um, when it comes to those controlled hunts because nobody's going to be buying hunting license like that or buying right. their duck stamps and stuff. So sure. it's difficult. So I guess with me, I got into it with Dakota. Um, what was that? Two about two, two or three years ago. I believe it was yeah around two. Yeah, I think two years. And ago. last year was your first successful hunt. Yeah, last year was the first time that. Um, I killed any ducks at all. I killed two with one shot, which was... <laughs> on his very first shot at duck. Yeah, which was the first time I'd ever even shot at a duck. You should have just walked two. to the truck and <laughs> I said, should've. I'm good. See ya. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've been out a handful of times with Dakota. I've been out with uh, Chaw a couple times, I believe. Um, you know, Sadly, and, you've come on all the days that were horrible. It's uh, And, you know, it, it happens. It's That's... <laughs> part of hunting you know you're not always going to go out and slay them unless no. like you guys said you do a bunch of scouting yep. you know exactly where they're going to be mm -hmm. but you got to put a crap ton of miles on the truck yeah with me you know i don't 
I'll be completely honest, I don't know what I'm doing when it comes <laughs> to duck hunting. I just go and I'm along for the ride. I'll help set up decoys, stuff like that. But I can call, I can make a quack, and that's about it. I mean, I'm not I'm not experienced whatsoever. So I'm glad that you guys are here today to you know <laughs> give the audience a little bit more information than what I can. So. I mean, and I mean, me and Dakota have been hunting for several years here, and you know, I think I started duck hunting when I was a freshman in high school. Um, but no matter how long you've been in it, you're always learning something every season. You have to adapt. Um, like I said, deer and turkey. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to rag on them. I'm, I'm a big deer hunter and turkey hunter myself, but duck hunting is by far the hardest type of hunting out there as far as how much effort you got to put into it how much scouting oh it's crazy it's nuts um you know it, it was funny um, after i kind of got started you know um my guitar teacher's next door neighbor was a big duck hunter and uh so he kind of got me into it took me in and after several years getting good you know this is my after my senior year of high school um fin feather had opened up just down the road from me and uh, I was pretty good on a duck call, not too bad. I mean, I'm not a world champion or anything like that, but I can call decent. And uh, met a guy down there at the Fen that actually uh, got me, you know, into a position where they actually signed me up for a waterfowl seminar. I was actually going to show people how to duck call and do decoys. They even put posters about it. I was so excited. One person showed up. It was absolutely the most let down day of my <laughs> duck hunting career. I was so excited. They had my name all over the stuff. Hey, come and learn how to blow a duck call decoys. I had one kid come up to me he's like how do i blow a duck call and i was like oh geez hmm. so i showed him and that was my uh, seminar and after that i uh, i guided for one year which uh that was interesting um for all those people that look at duck guides and all this stuff like you watch these hunting shows the guide life is not as pretty as it looks it sucks and i'll just be honest with you there because most of your clients are um the higher class guys that they just want a good duck hunt. They don't know how much work goes into it. They just show up and expect to limit out no matter what. Um, and the duck club that I worked at for a season was upwards of eight grand a year for a membership, just wow. for one person. And so these guys are your lot, you know, your yacht club guys, and they're just it's hilarious. They got the best gear in the world, but they still can't hit nothing. <laughs> those, kind of, those kind of people. And so we go out and. Um, I had an old Dodge 4x4, and I'd drive 45, 50 minutes to work every every week down there to guide. I'd make 30 bucks a day from these guys and tips. It was absolutely horrible. I was losing money. Um, guys don't listen to you when you're trying to tell them, hey, that's not the right species. Hey, don't shoot, don't shoot. Yeah, it, it just, it's not as fun as it looks. It's really not. So for all those that you know wish they were guides and punt at these duck clubs, you're not missing much. So... Uh, yeah, just enjoy hunting with your friends. It's a lot more fun than guiding. So we've touched base on it a little bit already about, you know, the decoys and waders, stuff like that. Yeah. So for people that's just now getting into it, what exactly would you say are the necessities that you would need for duck hunting? A place to go where there's ducks. <laughs> place yeah, to go where I mean, there's that's ducks. A good start. Um, <laughs> if you ain't got ducks, you might as well not even get into it. Uh, a helpful tip. I guess from somebody who's been there before, get a shotgun with a sling. There's nothing worse than trying to hold your shotgun while you're trying to walk through the marsh. You stumble. Just get a shotgun with a sling, put it on there. That way you have two hands. You can carry other things. Yes. Um, that's the main thing, and and that's little. I mean, if your if your shotgun doesn't have the ability to put a sling on it, you can drill a hole in the stock and then buy uh, the top where you can put a sling on it. And I think it'll cost you like 15 bucks. That's what I had to do on my first shotgun. Because my first shotgun um, didn't have an ability to put a sling on it. But we made sure I could put a sling on it after first <laughs> after my first couple times. Um, 12 decoys starting out. You can buy a dozen flambeau decoys. They're going to last you probably not even a season. I mean, <laughs> and like what we're, what we're saying, like why I guess duck hunting is so expensive. Is yeah, you can buy th some cheaper decoys. But you're going to have to either... Paint them or... Bubble wrap them after you chunk them. Exactly. Them. Like, you accidentally shoot a decoy. Like, the decoys I got, the paint, I've had them for three years now. And, yeah, I spend $75 on six of them. But you can spend $50 on 12 of them every year. And that's... You're basically at the same price. And you still have to buy more this year. And I'm mm -hmm. still using the ones that I got. So... Mm -hmm. And then if I shoot it, they're rubber. 
so that they don't necessarily sink right away versus like some of the plastic ones you shoot them man they're just destroyed so and we can tell i mean avian x um i know dakota you like using a lot of the avian yeah, x brand use, that's what i use is um, avian x. i've used a lot of avian x um dakota decoys aren't bad um, i've run those over the years for ducks i like them because they're a little bit oversized but um the nice thing about the avians um i'll kind of tell people that um are getting into it they're a little bit vibrant when you first buy them out of the box but after like a year when they kind of like get acclimated and that shininess kind of wears off they look super realistic after like the mm -hmm. second year yeah and they, they'll last you a long time they're rubber so they can bounce around on each other on your you know waterfowl rigs and not chip um really nice duck decoys um i would encourage people though don't go out and buy just straight mallard drakes um I know they're a little bit more expensive, but mix in some black ducks, some wood ducks, um, show a little bit of uh, diversity in your duck spread. A jerk cord, um, very inexpensive, but vital tool. Uh, I know, I'm sure Dakota can verify this, but when we started, mojos were the craze. Yeah. Um, mojos now, I mean, I've noticed them flare more and more ducks each year that I've used them. Yeah, I think, so it... It, mojos depend on the type of hunting like in a mojos in a field are killer stellar i mean yep. any any like spinning wing decoy in a field is just going to i mean ducks can see that from a long way away and they love it but it seems when you put the same mojo on the water and within the first the first week of season yeah those mojos are working pretty good because teal are still hanging around teal like mojos teal do like them, yeah. um so you have some ducks that aren't used to them yet the, the fresh ducks that come in but after that first week of season you got to think these ducks are coming from canada and if you hunt let's say if you hunt in some southern states they're seeing mojos the entire way down all the way and down Louisiana. yeah so these ducks are seeing everything so bring you, something different exactly to bring something different um typically what i i my first spread when I first go out is is not big because I like to see I don't like to put out a huge spread my first day out because I want to see what the ducks are going to do if they're responding to big spreads if they're re responding to small spreads so kind of keep it I guess bring what you would need but you don't have to put them all out right away right. and I just mallards and wood ducks mm -hmm. start out with that then if you're getting some if you're seeing some other duck species that's when you start you can start putting some of those other ducks um, black ducks are always a big one to put out there. Just the Just color ability. difference, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The color difference. Anything with like white. So buy buy a set of divers and put them separate from from your ducks. So like a blue, redheads. yeah, redheads, bluebills, um, bufflehead. But set them set them off to the side a little bit so they see that white. They see them ducks and then their eyes is attracting to the rest of the ducks in your kill zone and. Just have a little diversity, but see what ducks are out there too, because you don't want to put out a whole bunch of ducks and they're like, well, none of those are even around. Mm -hmm. Look as real as possible. A and, crane decoy is a really good yeah. idea too. I've noticed, um, I have one buddy that we stuck a, um, like a blue herring plastic, like garden decoration thing out there. It was just a plastic decoy thing out with our spread. And the ducks seem to be really um, at ease once they see that crane or, um, um, coot decoys if you guys can find those another thing you can find cheaper decoys that is if you go to these duck meets there are some duck meets around mm -hmm. where guys will swap decoys and gear um, and sell used decoys at an affordable price those little black coots if you throw those off to the right of your spread in a big cluster like a like a big flock there those can really help um, stay away from the standard j frame you know look of the decoy spread that everybody does i mean those ducks see that same hook pattern in a decoy spread all the way down all year and it's not natural ducks don't usually sit like that um, usually you have a little cluster here a little cluster there make it look realistic um, don't get so hung up on the J shape or a C shape or a U shape whatever especially if you're hunting marshes um, put a little you know three or four or five mallards over here have some space put another <coughs> cluster here make it look like little flocks mm. are coming in and out put a stray here and there um, you know, just make it look as realistic as possible. Um, but decoys, you're just going to have to feel for what that day inclines. I mean, yeah, I've shot a lot of ducks over crappy decoys. I've shot ducks over good decoys. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're not where the ducks want to be, 
it doesn't matter what you got. Yeah. I think that having, I guess, it, take it uh, day by day or I guess week by week because that's how kind of our, our duck season in Ohio is split up is our first season first part of the season comes in for two weeks and it's out for a week and then comes back in. So what I like to do is start off small because there's not a lot of ducks around. Ducks are dependent on weather and cold fronts to come down. Um, so when it's warm, when it's still 65 degrees in October, on October 15th, I think was the uh, starting date this year, um, there's not there's going to be a lot of teal, mallards, and wood ducks. And those are going to be mostly local birds. You're not going to get a whole lot of push from uh the prairie prot holes in uh canadia yet canadia um, <laughs> uh, but and then once the later season comes once you start getting those 40 degree days but it gets 32 at night you get a snowstorm a good north wind it's gonna push some birds down those flocks are going to get bigger so then that's when you start bringing your bigger spreads but then in late season when they've seen all those big spreads then it's time to consolidate down a little bit and get um, only six and add a lot of motion make it look real mm -hmm. so the bigger your spread it's harder to make them look real because you're gonna have decoys out there that have no motion especially on no wind days right. so bring those on those smaller groups make sure you have all your motion decoys out there that you can and everything looks moving because that's just gonna give the ducks confidence to come in for sure so what kind of like guns and chokes shells I'd calls say, yeah. What would you say, you know, would be good to start off with? Your choke tube and your shell are the most important. I don't, you know, you can shoot a pump. I've shot a pump for years. The only thing I don't like about a pump is on those cold mornings when you got a lot of layers on. It's hard to consistently rack a pump, you know, without getting a jam or a half rack. Um, you know, I started out with a very low-end Mossberg 500, which did not perform very well. Don't buy Mossberg. Um, it was kind of funny. It was that one year that Duck Commander sponsored um, Mossberg in their DVDs, and they're running these Duck Commander series Mossbergs. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, Oh wow, Mossberg must have you know made a decent shotgun. No, they didn't. They're still junk, and that's why they went back to Benelli. So um, don't shoot Mossbergs if you can for duck. Um, I have a Mossberg. I hunt with turkeys, and it's fine. But for waterfowl, for some reason, they're just not consistent in that brutal harsh weather. Um, I've shot Stogers, they're okay. The trigger is pretty crappy. That's the only thing I had to say about that. And it's a very high vented rib. Um, I now run a Beretta Outlander 300, which is one of my favorite shotguns I've ever owned. You can get it for around six, seven hundred bucks. Um, very consistent. I've never had a jam in it. It's very accurate. It's very consistent. Points real good. Um, Dakota, you've shot Benelli for years. Mm -hmm. um, had a lot of good success there. Just recently bought a Browning. Browning Maxis Wicked Wing. That's right. Um, I'm excited to shoot that. I haven't even shot that yet. Uh, so I shoot. I have a Benelli uh, Super Black Eagle Three. Um, I kill a lot of ducks behind that. Um, I'm excited to use this Browning too. Uh, but I guess if you were going to do it on a budget, a Remington 870. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't go wrong with it. It nope. shoots three inch shells. Get a sling for it. Everything's pretty pretty cheap for it. Um, if you're wanting, I guess, to upgrade a little bit, I'd go with a semi-auto shotgun or auto loader. 1187 um, or something. Yeah, 1187, something like that. Even, but even the the Outlander, like what Charles shoots, I mean, that's not a bad price point for for an auto loader shotgun, especially one of the quality of like that one is. Mm -hmm. um, I know Zach here shoots a Winchester SX4. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good shooting gun. It's, and I got it just so I could, you know, hunt turkeys with it and mm. ducks. Yeah, and it, I'm, you know, that's that's basically the only time I really use a gun. Right. Yeah. During deer season, we're usually done by gun season anyway, so right. I got something that I could use for both. Yeah, and you Probably can go with twelve gauge. Yeah, go with twelve, which gauge. is what I got. And um, just so you guys know, I think that was nine forty nine was what I paid for it. Mm -hmm. So, and it's been a great gun for me. I mean, I haven't had it jam up not one time. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are the the high rollers with the thousand dollar guns, which well, not mine's me. close. Mine, mine's six ninety nine. So yours was okay. Yeah, mine. Well, Dakota over here with the about three thousand dollars worth of guns, if not more. I like fancy things, but <laughs> but there's nothing wrong. With that. There's hey, nothing if wrong. it works, it works. So and if you can afford it, then. You know, yeah. do it. The, the, I guess the difference, why you want to pay a little bit more for your shotgun, 
um, is because the environment that you're going to put these shotguns in is bad. Is bad. It's not for where a shotgun should be. You got to think you're going to be in water, muck, and it's going to be cold. Ice. If you don't come, if you don't go home and you have a 870 and you don't come home and you don't take that thing apart and clean it, that gun's going to rust out faster than what you can count. Very I mean, nice. it's and like the more expensive guns like what we got, they just have a coating that's going to help you out. I mean, when it's cold like that and you get water on your gun, so when it's gas, um, especially on an auto loader, it's going to jam because those gas ports are going to get froze over with the water getting in them. So you're going to have jams. Um, the gun, the Super Black Eagle is inertia driven, so it's using the power of the shell to eject the shell and rack the new one. Those are going to jam less because it's not, there's nothing, unless you dunk the whole gun in the water and the whole thing froze, is frozen, you're still going to be able to, to cycle shells as long as your shells don't get wet. Um, and the pumps, the pumps are good. It's just if it gets frozen, it's going to be harder to rack. Um, so don't take a, your grandpa's collector's yeah, 16 gauge off you're, the park. You're gonna, it's the gun's going to get beat up. Yep. So and over and under is not a bad idea either for people getting started. Um, Stevens 555 makes a reasonable over and under 12 gauge. Mm -hmm. um, I hunted with one for a couple seasons. Um, not bad. What's kind of nice about an over under, if you do do that, you can have your top barrel is an open pattern and your bottom barrel is a little more tight. Um, and you can run two different types of shells. Like if you're in a, you know, have one in the bottom, number two is the one top, number four is for that flock at the close range shot. So that's kind of nice. Um, but you can really take almost any shotgun out there and use it. Um, I'd say your choke tube mm -hmm. and your shell that you're shooting is probably the most important. Um, and why is that and what kind of chokes and shells do you guys patterns, recommend? Yeah, patterns are everything. I yeah. think Dakota can verify. If you don't have a good pattern, you're going to get a lot of cripples, which means it, that's another thing that's expensive. For a good box of shells, I mean, for the past three years I've ran the Heavy Steel, which is just their economic straight steel blend. Um, I usually run number twos. And I've had no problems with those. I think those are around 17, 18 bucks a box for 25, and that's cheap um, for waterfowl. Um, I've never had issues with them because I keep my shots 40 and in. I don't even take 40 yard shots most of the time. Uh, me and Dakota, we, we do a lot of decoy hunting. Um, so that's one thing. I will say the heavy metal is probably, I think that's around 25 bucks a box, something like that. Yeah, I think it's 20, 25 or 26, yeah. depending. Not a bad shell. They're great. I like them. The new ones now have um, bismuth in them, which is a, a very nice you know touch as far as having a, a little bit denser pellet than just straight steel. Um, I might try some of the Kent bismuth this year. It's a little pricey, but I might try it. Um, but no matter what you shoot, you know you can shoot a super expensive shell, but if your pattern's not good, you're just going to have to shoot birds multiple times. And that's just, that's over a buck a shot each time you shoot. So you shoot a buck, you know, uh, I mean, a duck three or four times trying to finish a cripple out on the lake. Yeah. And there goes five, six bucks. I right. Mean, it's, it gets pricey. So um, I shoot a full choke, and that's not for long range. Most people get it mixed up where I shoot, a, you know, modified for close range, full choke for long range. No. I don't believe you should shoot a duck past 40 yards ever unless it's a cripple or something like that. Um your kinetic energy as far as your pellets and all that stuff just is not there to knock down especially in the winter when these birds have a lot of fat a lot of mm -hmm. feathers on them. it's just not consistently going to kill ducks unless you're using like tungsten and paying 60 bucks a box um so i shoot the kicks high flyer um extended modified um, i'm shooting the full this year i like a full choke because if you shoot you know, number twos is very popular, but if you shoot a smaller pellet size, like a number four, you're going to have more pellets in that pattern, which is going to make it more dense. So with a full choke of number fours, you're going to have a very tight pattern and a very dense pattern. So you're either going to smoke them and crush them, or you're going to totally miss the bird and not cripple it, which I'm kind of a fan of. Um, you know, Dakota, what, what do you run for choke tubes? Uh, so for choke tubes, I this year um, I just ran what came. So your my Benelli comes with... Steel. So I guess what we should do, take us all the way back, and when you're buying choke tubes, you have to make sure they say steel, for steel shot use or steel okay. Right. Because waterfowl, it's illegal to use a toxic 
um, shells. So like lead, you can't use lead. That's why when we're talking about bismuth or tungsten and steel and you're like, well, I have five shot turkey loads that are that are lead. Well, you can't use those. Um, they all got to be non-toxic. So you have to make sure your choke tube. I didn't tube, even know that. Yeah. You have to make sure your choke tube can shoot non-toxic um, steel because steel is just a little bit faster. They're lighter. So they don't bring that kinetic energy out past really 40 yards. So that's why when we're talking about bismuth, bismuth is denser or tungsten's really dense and it takes that kinetic energy out further. Mm -hmm. That's why those shells are more expensive. Um, it's kind of like a full metal jacket versus a hollow point. Exactly. So I guess that's the the basics on like the chokes and stuff. The chokes I like to use, um, Benelli sent with them. I just use the kind of the, the stock stuff. Um, I didn't really find a need, I guess, to buy them yet because I found that my gun patterned okay. And they I tried, might, they yeah, might, you know. I tried a bunch. So basically I've been, I buy a box of shells and I try, I think I have like eight or ten boxes of shells back there that I won't shoot because they just, it didn't pattern right or I didn't like how they shoot. Um, so you got to just kind of test it out, test the waters. But before I had my Benelli, I used um, heavy metals brand of choke tubes and my Remington 1187 um, I used mid-range is what I like to use um, I just found extended range you really you're not gonna get much more I mean an extra five yards maybe because again these steel shells they're not you're not gonna be packing much of a punch out past 45 yards and that's at 45 if you're lucky um, and especially if they're 45 straight out, but they're another 50 up. I mean, and that's, so I guess to even take it even further back. So like when we talk about sky busting, that means you're shooting at ducks that you know you can't kill, but you're kind of just shooting at them to see if something falls. A lucky um, pellet. Yeah. The, <laughs> luck, for that the, lucky pellet. the lucky pellet. Um, everybody has been guilty of that at one point in time. And if they tell you that they haven't been in their younger years, I'm the sure they're, they're lying. Everybody's been like, oh, I think I can make that shot, and then you yep. shoot, and then you realize, no, you can't, and then you probably think to yourself, oh, I'm just a bad shot, but I know I can still make it. No, it's not that you're a bad shot, it's just probably that, that shell's not strong enough to <coughs> knock that bird down at that high. It's a shotgun, not a rifle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's what we're talking, when we refer to sky busting, um, that's what we're referring to, just taking shots that you know is too far for the equipment that you got. Mm -hmm. um, I tried Heavy X. Um, that's the tungsten stuff made by heavy metal that work. It, yeah, it's ex extremely expensive. I bought a box cause it was on sale at fin feather and fur. Um, it worked really well, but it hurt every time I took a shot at like a cripple or I missed cause you can go through three shells pretty fast and at $50 a box, that's $2 a shell. So I just went through six bucks in a matter of three and no ducks fell. So that's another thing. <laughs> Resist the urge to send that third shell if you haven't hit them on the first two. Yeah. That's what's bad about the semi -auto. That's that's when they're probably they're out there at that range where you're kinda of, you're kinda of just hoping for some luck. You Unless are. they're still in your face and you got and you have the flock come in, but if you've done miss two already, that third one's probably not gonna help you out. No. I've gone three for three on ducks <laughs> twice in my life. And I've hunted for years. And they were both in the field and they landed almost right up on top of me. So they weren't at that 30 yard mark and then picking up and leaving. Mm -hmm. Geese you can deal with, but try to resist sending that third shell if you haven't killed something on your first two because now you're just wasting a shell usually at that point. Um, but like, you know, Dakota, I, I like running number fours early season till the second split and then I'll switch to number twos. And like I said, I, I shoot a full choke, not for the range. I shoot it for a tighter pattern. Um, and with number four shot, that's a lot of pellets, and they're just hitting a wall mm -hmm. um, at closer range. So that's why I shoot that. I know you know Dakota likes the the modified choke, and it's all what your gun pattern's the best in. Um, Kex High Flyers, I think you're going to run about sixty bucks for one of their choke tubes. Yeah, the heavy metal. The heavy metal was four, uh, forty. Yeah. But so I guess stick to the name brands. You you probably can't go wrong. Buy buy Jebs, a name brand. Jebs choke yeah, tubes Jebs, um, heavy metal. Just Pattern Master. Pattern Master is good one. Pattern Master is really good, but again, you're gonna you're gonna have to pay for some some nicer choke tubes. Yep. But stick Get to what you pay for. yeah, stick to the name brands. Um, Carlson's a good one. Carlson makes some good choke tubes. Mm -hmm. Stick to the name brands. You're gonna get the most bang for your buck out of them. Um, I like to run fours 
in the early season too because the the ducks that I'm shooting don't have the feathers and the fat that's kind of stopping those. So I just want more more pellets out there. Um, come later season, I'll, st I'll start to move to twos, and then in the really late season, I, I I shoot BB, sometimes even triple B, depending on like if it's just a goose hunt because ducks go out before geese in Ohio. Um, I'll just run triple B or uh, something along those lines where just get the bigger pellets because they just pack more knockdown power than like shooting a goose with four shot. I mean, it's kind of especially in late season. You can if you can run a headshot. Yeah, at the time. but it's kind of that's again that's unethical, and we try to we try to kill the bird. We don't try to wound birds and have them die on somebody else's property because I mean right. we enjoy eating them. Yep. that's the main reason why we're out there, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, and because it's fun. I will um, say I do run number twos for geese, but again, I'm shooting that full choke, which is a super tight pattern. Um, and I mean, if you practice enough, you can get headshots or that upper frontal shot on a goose and kill them with twos just fine, yeah. but I would not run anything Any, smaller. No, no nothing less, ex especially in late season. Especially in that late season. I mean, I've, I've killed a goose with four shot, but that's because it was in October and I was hunting ducks and a goose flew over and that's all I had in my gun and he was probably not even 20 yards I mean he was 15 but at 40 you ain't killing that goose with four shot no matter what time but mm -hmm. you just you got a good shot at 20 15 yards um they're basically flying right over top of your head where you can almost grab them feel like you can touch them with your gun you probably kill them with yeah. a gun at that right yeah you can you can uh you can do some damage with some four shot but it's just Go out there, take the time, pattern your shotgun. Once you buy a choke tube and you shoot one box of shells and it didn't pattern how you want it, don't give up on it. Because it's not that the choke tube's bad, especially if you buy one of these name brand ones. It's probably just because that choke tube and that gun doesn't shoot those shells how you want them to. Find the box of shells that works for you, yeah. I yeah, guess is yeah. what I would say. you got to spend money in the waterfowl world to get some what you want. And I'd say the best thing you can do is find a guy that already duck hunts. Um, try to offer something you know say hey you know offer to tag along just learn something because mm -hmm. it i know myself i learned everything uh, by my, i mean for the most part on my own except for my guitar teacher's neighbor that you know really took me under his wing after a couple years but it's super hard to get into if you just have nobody that knows what they're doing so if you can find one of those old veterans that know what they're doing and they can teach you something go with them uh don't scream on the duck call every time you see a flock <laughs> calling we'll get into that um, zinc makes a great call. Um, yeah, let's let's go ahead and transition. Like, what kind of duck calls do you guys use, and is there a preference? Like, you know, what's good calls, what's bad calls? Stay away like that. from Walmart calls. I know Duck Commander does make some good duck calls, but a lot of their cheaper, lower end plastics are going to jam up in cold weather. So you kind of want to stay away from those. Um, I have. Uh, a zinc, you know, I run them as far as commercials. A lot of my calls um, I have from guys that actually make them, like custom-made duck calls, um, kind of more art. I mean, they do sound great, but they're more pricey. If you're looking just to get something that'll work for a, a decently reasonable amount of money, zinc, I'd say, is probably your best route um, for quality and sound. Um, and they'll tune them for you. You can send them, and they'll tune them for you, get them to what you want. r and not bad. Um... What else am I missing here, Dakota? Uh, I think Jargon is a new call that uh, the Fowl Life really digs into nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, they're out of Arkansas. Great duck call there. Very raspy. I So I use a zinc call. And I, a tip, so to actually use a duck call in the field, you can buy a Walmart one. Um, again, early season is going to be great. But once you get down to 30 degrees, those reeds are going to freeze together and that duck call is not going to work. Nope. You drop that call in the water you're done. or you bend down to grab a shell and you're in the water and duck calls in the water, it's going to freeze up. But I guess don't go out and buy a extremely expensive one and then realize and try to practice on it and give up. Buy that $10 call and if you can make a duck noise mm -hmm. on those $10 calls, That's those cool. Walmart calls, yeah. Then upgrade and to get to uh, like a zinc because that's what I did. I bought I had a cheap. Actually, zinc makes some good quality cheaper calls too. I, I bought a power hand for twenty five bucks. Does it sound the greatest? Is it the reeds gonna stick and everything like that? Yeah, they are. But you make a duck noise. You make you can start making that quack consistently. Then upgrade on your call and that's just gonna take your calling to the next level 
having that new call because you're able to do different things. It sounds louder. You can make it quieter, louder. Um, but yeah, get just get a call and try to make noises on it. Yeah. Make duck sounds, I guess, not just noises, but make duck sounds on it, and then figure out because again, my zinc call may not work for Chaw, just like Chaw's calls may not work for me because it depends on how I blow. Like I blew his duck call, I didn't sound as good as what he does on it because the air that it takes is different. His is real light. Mine takes a lot of air. So I have to, I'm used to putting a lot of pressure behind my call. And that's what breaks your reeds over to make the duck sounds. For sure. And his doesn't take a lot. So it's just easier for him. That's what he's used to. And for people that are going to buy a duck call and blow on it, you're going to think it's broke. Because here's, here's what you're going to hear when you blow into a duck call. You're going to think it's broke. It's not. A duck call is not like a deer grunt call or a deer bleat where you can just blow and get that magical sound. With a duck, you have to tighten your stomach, you have to growl into it, um, your tongue is your biggest, um, your biggest ally when it comes to ducks. Um, I tighten my stomach and I try to say the word tin, tin, like T-I-N, tin, or the number tin, tin, whatever, because your tongue's hitting the roof of your mouth and coming back down, um, but you have to tighten your stomach. Um, if you tighten your stomach and just get that air coming through the roof of your mouth and then drop your tongue, this is, you know, I'll, here's me just tight stomach blowing it with the tongue in the roof of my mouth. That's what you're going to get. And you're in a, your stomach's going to hurt the first couple days learning how to blow, but you'll get used to it. So you're doing... Now when you drop that tongue, it's... You get that, you know, that quack sound when you do it. So just practice that. Um, you don't have to go. You can literally sit in the marsh and go. And get ducks to come into you. I mean, ducks do that. Mm -hmm. um, feeding chuckles. Um, I know Dakota, he has a hard time rolling his tongue. And all he can do is. Which is actually what duck, ducks really sound like. That's And that's kind of. I can't roll, I, I wish I could do like the machine gun where it's da -da 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 -da. Yeah, that's a machine gun. That's a thousand ducks. Yeah. That's a large amount of ducks. So ducks, when they make that feeding chuckle, it's not really like they're, ha they're happy and content, but what they're doing is, is they're feeding and they're letting know other ducks where they're at and this is their space. And you, they start getting, they will like tick, tick, tick. So it's letting other ducks know that, hey, I'm here, and then once another duck starts coming in closer, then the, they might get a little bit more aggressive, a little loud with it. Yep. But when you hear, like, that machine gun, like what I said, that's hundreds of ducks. So you if you're going do to, that with six decoys. You do not do that with six decoys. <laughs> um, so kind of, and that's why I like to be a little bit more realistic, and one, I, I say that because I can't do it, so that's why I'm going to stick to No, but to I it. agree with that. Um, <laughs> I agree with that. But I wish I could because it sounds cool when you're sitting in your duck room and everybody's calling and you can just hammer on the thing. Yeah. Um, but, no, I mean, it's it's diff It's difficult to try to start. What I did is I watched a bunch of YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. find, and then find somebody that does a YouTube video that explains it how – and watch different people because you might watch one guy and be like, oh, it's not really working. Turn on a different guy. He might explain it in a different way. Um, yeah, you just got to make sure tight stomach. Uh, if you've used a turkey call before, it's the same kind of feeling as like a mouth call. Yeah. It's, you're using your diaphragm to yep. do it. Um, call, I guess calling in the marsh is different, I, I would say, because you have to figure out if those birds, if you're hammering on that call and those birds don't want anything to do with you, change it. Then stop calling. Yes. It, or if you have ducks, if you have ducks cupped up, and if you don't know what like uh, ducks cupped up looks like, look up a video of like ducks cupping into a spread. It's, if you have oh, ducks yeah. doing that, there's no reason to t pull your car out because they're already come, they're already coming in. Right. Like you don't need to call them at that point. That's they've already the decided to the duck call. Yeah. Get them to come to you. But if they're coming to you, just shut yeah, them. Yeah, they've already because all you can do is with you call, you're Spare. not going to make them want to come in any faster because they can't. So either they're just going, you're just going to flare them, or you're just going to not have your hands on your guns when you're ready right. to shoot. And you know when you're watching these YouTube videos, or like me when I watch the Duck Commander guys, all you see and all you hear is <laughs> just hammering, and then boom, 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 and hundreds of ducks fall. That's not, they're showing you a very small part of that because they're showing you the, the killing part each and every time. They're not showing you the approach a lot of times. Mm -hmm. On the approach, um, I'll quack a couple times 
you know, a field scenario versus marsh scenario is very different. If I'm running like three or four dozen decoys out in, you know, a field for mallards, I will do that machine gun because I'm trying to sound like a crap ton of ducks. With a marsh, it's different. You just want that. Um, but like Dakota said, you don't want to hammer on ducks very loud at all. Make a couple quacks, let them know you're there. That's all you're doing. And as soon as, even if one turns and they kind of look at you for a second, but they're still deciding, shut up. He knows you're there. Let them think, you know, um, and that, you know, everything comes down to your hunt spot. If you're where they want to be, I've had hunts where I haven't made a single sound. Yeah. I've killed a bunch of birds because I was where they were coming. Why call? Most of the time you'll, you'll find when you get out there duck hunting, you'll be talking to your buddies and all of a sudden you'll have ducks like in your spread and you're, and you're just not the paying old, attention. The old, the old crap moment. Um, but I've, I've also had it where I've had ducks where if I didn't continuously call to them, oh, yeah. they would not want to come in. Some they, you got to keep them on yeah, the line. They loved hearing that sound and they were like, okay. And then as soon as I would stop calling because I thought they were a little too close, they just, interest. boom, they'd be, they'd be gone. Yeah. And ducks, so when ducks work, when we call ducks working, they circle you. So ducks aren't going to hear that call and come straight in. 99% of the time yep. they're what they're going to do is they're going to circle you out at about 40 yards and you're going to want to take that shot your first time out there because you're like oh man that was close don't shoot yeah don't shoot just wait let them ducks do it again and don't if they start getting four times yeah if they start getting farther away that means they're not liking something if they once you see them start getting closer and closer that means they're they're getting ready to prepare to land because they have to land into the wind so they have to get everything just right for them to land you want the, the wind at your back yeah blowing out in front of you because they will get their face into the wind they use the wind to slow themselves down mm -hmm. that's what that cupping motion is they're catching the wind and slowing down mm -hmm. it's like flaps on a on a plane when it's coming in for kind of like like a uh, parachute kind it of. is that's yeah, a exactly. parachute effect they, they they slow down so so pay attention to the wind crossing shots are fine um set your decoy spread accordingly um but your the wind is the duck hunter's biggest yeah. friend if you got a lot of wind Man, that's a great day to go. Um, sunny days, I have not had success duck hunting very often on sunny days. In a field, I've done okay. Marshes, you want those cloudy, sometimes drizzly, windy days um, where the ducks are looking to go into those shallow marshes and bed down for the day because of the wind. It'll blow them off the bay, at least up here it does. It'll get them off that big body of water where the winds are just ripping, and they'll come into those smaller marshes, and that's where you can just make your payday I mean, just work. I've so had, that that was my my next question. I was going to ask you guys was the weather, you know, bad weather. Is bad different. weather is what I've always heard hunting with you guys. If you have bad weather, more than likely it'll be a good day. Yes. So go ahead and elaborate yeah. on that a so little bit for everyone. My my success this year actually had pretty decent success on sunny days, which is is new for me. Um, I guess bad weather is easier to kill ducks. You can still kill ducks on nice days, but... They're going to be flying high. They're going to be flying high. The shadows that you put on the water, so like you have to make sure you're well hidden. You have to make sure you have movement because they're seeing all these things now because it's bright. So like your movement and your decoys has to be on point. You can't be moving because they can see you. Like let's say you have the sun to your back and you're casting a human-like shadow on your decoys. Ducks aren't going to come into that. When you have overcast, you don't have to worry about it. So there's a lot more that goes into hunting those sunny days because you you don't want the sun at your back, but then if you have the sun in your face, you can't see. So you have to make sure you have sunglasses and being able to shoot with sunglasses and everything like that. Um, so a lot of that stuff plays into hunting on those sunny days. That's what makes it difficult. Everyone like they're, But most of the time, those, those crappier days, the ducks are going to be flying lower, there's going to be wind, so they're not going to be able to get up as high, because when there's a lot of high winds and ducks are up high, they have to work more, because the winds are stronger the higher you go. So they have to fight that wind more, so they like to be low, which brings those ducks closer to you, which right. is always a good thing. Common sense is, yeah. is a big thing with ducks. Um, if you see ducks lighting 200 yards away from your spread, don't sit there where you're at and just scream at them or say, oh, I just got to call louder. Move. Yeah. If you can. Get up and move. Don't I, don't ride out a bad spot and ruin your whole afternoon. I know. I've had people ask me, um, well, I see ducks over there. How do I call them over to me? You don't. <laughs> you go to where the ducks are. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There ain't no call that's going to bring that duck 200 yards to come look at your spread again. No. You can it, call turkeys where they don't really want to go and other game which is kind of funny a turkey you can call almost anywhere a duck they're going to be where they want to be exactly um, 
where they feel safe. I mean, the best your best bet is if you're in a spot where ducks don't want to be is midday when they're just kind of hopping around and they're going from like pond loafing pond to loafing pond to eating. Which is another thing in Ohio, technically you're not allowed to hunt loafing ponds. So check your state regulations and all that stuff. There's some weird laws and all. It, some duck hunting laws are really far out there, like the whole lead thing. I think that's a hunk of crap because you're still allowed to use lead fishing weights and all kinds of other lead products out in the lakes when you're fishing. And you're allowed to kill turkeys with lead, doves with lead, everything else, but not, you know, whatever. That's another topic for another day. But um, you got to be where they want to be. Exactly. Got to be. Um, high winds are a great thing. Snow is my favorite, favorite thing. If I can um, hear snow or not hear, see snow coming in the forecast the next morning, yeah, I can hear snow. No. See snow in the forecast. I can hear it. I can I hear can it. smell I it. I feel it's it in my coming. bones. It's coming. <laughs> but no, um. My best duck hunts and goose hunts were in the snow. Um, a great trick, um, if you find a hunt corn fields, don't hunt bean fields. Ducks are not going to be in bean fields. I've never seen them in bean fields. If Unless they, they're flooded. If they're flooded. Yeah. But if they're not flooded, no, they're typically, dry, typically you're not going to see them. Don't hunt in a bean field. So here's the thing with snow. Snow pushes all these ducks out of Canada. So you get huge new waves of birds every time there's a snowstorm, usually. Um, Several years ago, me and my buddy uh, Braden and Fish, um, I've been hunting with them since I was in high school. Uh, we kind of all, you know, cut our teeth on the duck hunting world together. We got permission from this one guy. It's a funny story. I'll tell this story here. Um, I am. Um, I live in this one area near my house, and there's a bunch of cornfields about, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And we saw this field just lighten. I mean, when I say thousands of ducks and geese, it was thousands of ducks and geese. It was black the field was black and there was no snow on the ground this was right before a snowstorm and i'm like oh man in the morning it's supposed to snow overnight so as soon as they wake up they're gonna ducks panic when there's snow they have to get on food and get ready in case the marshes seize up or whatever they panic so they run to food so hunt cornfields right before snow or during the snow so we're traveling all around town looking for this landowner we have a name. We don't know where he lives. We even went to the county auditor's office and asked the lady at the front desk who owns this parcel. She gave us a name. Um, now you have, you know, Hunt X and Hunt Stan that'll actually show you parcel info, who owns what. We did not have that at the time, should have, but we didn't. So we traveled all day, found this old man, got permission. We're like, oh man, this is this, oh man, this is it, this is it. This is going to be the hunt of our careers. So we get up at 3 o'clock in the morning when the snow starts. It's below 20. Minus 20 below zero. I mean, it's horribly cold. Wind is whipping at 20 mile an hour. I mean, it is just, oh, your bones are aching. So we get out there at 3 o'clock. We're unloading decoys. A great trick, if it's not pouring down snow and it keeps doing this, take a snow blower and blow the snow off right where you're going to set your decoys. And that makes it look like geese have been sitting on that all night trying to thaw out the ice and snow to eat. So if you kind of just blow patches where they can see corn, in places like where they can get to, that's going to be a huge magnet. So just a little tip trick there. So we're setting all these decoys, and to our knowledge, we're the only ones that have permission for the field. An hour before shooting light, here comes two trucks and two trailers pulling into the field. And that is just, as a duck hunter, that is your worst nightmare. That is like you just got kicked in the stomach. It's horrible because you work so hard to get where you're at you've scouted i mean we put i mean when i'm talking hours on the truck that day trying to find stuff we did and so this guy rolls up and it's a pretty big field but it's not big enough to hunt hold more than i mean you never want to have more than two hunting parties in a field and uh so he walks up and he's just he's ticked because we're there and he's like well you know we'll just set 100 yards behind you and i'm like well heck no you're not i mean that ain't flying and all this crap and i said hey you should have got out of bed should have been here first and he showed me his permission slip. I showed him mine. I said, hey, I have every right to be here. I was here first. So he just proceeds to set his decoys up 100 yards behind us. And at that point, my buddy Braden, you know, if we ever have him here on the podcast, he's a character, and he's not soft-spoken, and he speaks his mind. So he goes up to this guy and says, I will literally shoot in the air every time a duck even thinks about coming in this field, and you will kill nothing. <laughs> So they're about ready to go to blows. I mean, it's getting bad. And I'm irritated because this guy's just being a jerk. And he's like, well, I got the Avian X guys, you know, here and all this stuff. And I'm trying to get them on a field. And I was like, I don't care if you have Fred Zink himself out here. 
I don't care. We were here first. Right. And what was nice is one of the cameramen from the Avian X guys came over, and he didn't know what was going on. He's like, you know, after I explained to him, hey, we were here first. This guy that said he's taking you hunting is being kind of a, you know, a jerk, and he's trying to screw us out of a hunt that, hey, we've worked way harder, and we were out here first. And he's like, oh, that's, hey. And so he got irritated with this guy as well, and he's like, no, we're not screwing these guys. So they started packing out, and I went over to the, the cameraman, his name Brian, and I was like, hey, you know, you know, there was nine of us total, nine people. And he's like, well, what do you think if we all sat together? And I'm sitting there, Braden's won nothing to do with this guy. So how many were in your group? There just was just three of us. There's three of us, okay. me, Braden, and Fish. And they okay. had uh, six other guys with them. So there was nine people. Um, including the cameraman no these are just hunters okay yeah so this is this is a this is a gang of boys right here and i'm sitting there and i'm like this is not looking good we got nine people that's a lot of blinds it's a lot of people you're trying to hide this just but we agreed to it Braden, i was able to calm him down and put it opposite ends of the line so he wouldn't be tempted to fight this guy so we sat there we killed 19 mallards 27 geese um we killed a lot of a lot of street green several blacks um, and one hen. My buddy Fish was actually the only one that shot a hen. He killed the one hen out of 50 green heads. Um, that was right in his face, but he crushed it. And Fish was all about eating ducks. He didn't care if it's a hen or a mallard, which it's kind of funny as a society of duck hunters why we, it's just weird. Like, oh, you know, there's something to be said about just shooting straight mallard drakes. Whereas I remember the years where I'd be very happy to kill a hen or anything that was legal. So it's kind of funny but anyway it was a great hunt um with nine guys we crushed them in 20 minutes got out of there um and what was really cool a couple days later i think it was the next week um i offered um brian along with Braden. uh we both offered for brian to bring a uh, fred out to one field so it was kind of neat um he we actually got to be on uh, an episode of the zinc and avian x waterfowl tv series so that was kind of neat we were got to film an episode with fred um, shooting some geese in a field that we had permission for so that was really neat and um, I will just say uh, you know on, on Fred's behalf there great guy um, really down to earth really nice guy um, you never really know what these guys that are extremely successful you know what you wonder if it goes to their head if you know they're gonna think they're above you uh, I will say Fred Zink was one of the coolest guys you ever met um, it was just like hunting with an old friend out there and uh, super generous guy really nice and uh, we feel pretty honored that we were able to hunt with him there. And uh, also we get to say, hey, we were on Avian X TV, so that was kind of yeah, cool. Yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. That you was don't get cool. to just meet up with people like that every day and then no. end up on a TV show. It was awesome. Um, and we, we killed our limited geese there. It was uh, it was really neat. So um, the snow is kind of where I've had my, uh, my best hunts there. And uh, it was kind of cool how a hunt started to be, oh, man, you know, here we go to – meeting new people and new friends and got to um, actually end up hunting with Fred Zink, which is kind of one of my uh, idols, I guess, when I started duck hunting. You know, he's kind of a big name in the industry, and uh, he's kind of like the Phil Robertson of the North, I guess it's fair much. to say. Well, so Z so Zink and Avian X is started in Ohio. Um, Castalia, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I guess it's pretty cool. Um, that's one of the big, the big guys up here for sure. Um, I guess one thing, I guess if we're going to talk about weather, we're going to have to talk about clothing yes. to deal with in that weather. Yes. Um, don't skimp on clothing or waders or anything like that because you will be cold and then you get cold and it's wet because you're in a marsh, so stuff is going to get wet and damp yep. and your waders are going to freeze yep. and everything's going to be cold and you're not going to want to hunt anymore. You're going to want to go home. <laughs> So to keep give yourself the best chance of killing ducks and staying out there as long as you can, dress warm. Buy expensive waders. They're yeah. gonna be expensive. Don't buy hundred dollar waders. Spend two hundred bucks on some good insulated waders that aren't gonna tear. Like we said at the beginning of the episode, duck hunting is extremely expensive. And if you want to enjoy the hunt and have a chance to kill good ducks, you're gonna have to buy good equipment. I mean, you can get by with cheap waders. I mean, I started out with cheap stuff, but it was, like Dakota said, miserable, freezing. Um, the one biggest thing I'd say that I have just, I mean, I will, I mean, I'm in love with it, 
is the Craftsman. Um, they have a vest that is, it's an electric mm -hmm. heated vest that you can actually <clears throat> plug into a phone outlet and charge up. Yeah. And for field hunts or even marsh hunts, that is stellar. Yep. Especially if you're hunting in below zero, you will be thanking God you have a heated vest or coat. Um, my gosh, what a stellar piece of equipment if you're going to hunt in cold, cold weather, especially out in the field where the wind is whipping. So I'd say that's probably my favorite piece of clothing. Yeah, or yeah. you guys can do what I do, buy the basics and go with people that already have all the most expensive stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty, sure, that way. I'm pretty sure every <laughs> hunt that Nash has been on, duck hunt, he's used one up pair of my, my old waders. Well, I have waders now, oh, but got them now. I don't have decoys or anything like that. I have the clothes, the you gun, the shells. There you go. So, but decoys, calls, that stuff can yeah, get expensive. What, what Nash is saying is find somebody that already is established in it. Yes. Because yes. for me and Shaw, like I had my buddy PJ introduce me into it, but I got everything. I kind of started going by myself because I wanted to go more and more. And I didn't have decoys, and I just kind of basically taught myself and and got everything. And trust, you're going to make mistakes if you're going out there by yourself, not knowing. Like I took my dad on a, on one of our first duck hunts uh, by ourselves, and we set our decoys completely backwards. Um, I fell in the marsh and filled my waders up with ice water. I mean, it was it was a rough time. It was a rough go. Making memories. Yeah. But that's, that was one of my favorite hunts. Um, but I made a lot of mistakes, and guess what? We came back with zero ducks that day. So. <laughs> and, and this is not to discourage people. Oh, man, I hate to say this because a lot of people are not going to want to do it. You will probably not kill any ducks your first year. If you, you won't. If you go by yourself. <clears throat> if you're going by yourself, you're, yeah, more likely. <laughs> I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't kill a duck my first six times. Yeah. Um, and basically, the only reason why I even killed one was because I was hunting. Me and my again, I went. I go, I hunt a lot with my buddy Troy, and I took him out for his first time. But his first time taking him out was my second season hunting, and my first season I killed eight ducks. So, and that was just because we were in some good spots, and we couldn't yep. mess that up. Yep. And that's the reason why. But. Yeah, we, so we kind of taught ourselves, and even then, like, even now, I still go out, and there's times where I don't kill anything, and... It happens. It it definitely ha It's not... Everything's got to kind of go your way for you to kill ducks, and yeah. you don't get a lot of chance, especially where I go, because I, I hunt a lot of public land, so I'm competing most of the time. You don't get a lot of second chances, no. so you get a flock of ducks to come in, and you miss. You might only get one flock of ducks for the day. Yep. So that's why it's just extremely important to make sure everything is, is going how you want it and making sure that your gear's good, your clothes are good, so you can stick out there and wait for that flock of ducks because that might be your opportunity. Right. And those the new people make make the most of that one opportunity. You get one duck to come in. That's why if you sky bust them too far at 40 yards, that's the only duck you get to come in. That was the only chance to shoot a duck. Yep. You let them come in and, and, and get your chance. So you're just going to make a lot of mistakes your first year. You're not going to really know, but you're going to learn a lot your first year. Because my first year, I killed eight ducks. And my second year, I was up to 43. Yep. So it's just that that learning curve is a tough one. But don't get discouraged. Um, if you need to, find somebody that already knows how to kill ducks. Go with them so you can shoot your gun a little bit. For sure. Um, and they can teach you a little things. But, yeah, don't get discouraged because I want to see... Like, the selfish part of me doesn't want any more duck hunters because I want all yeah, the marshes to tough. myself. It, yeah. But I know for the longevity of duck hunting and hunting in general, we need people. Um, we need people because our hunting license sales in Ohio is going down every year. Because it's getting so expensive. I mean, and it's just, and you, we're losing less and less people because those guys that are 60, losing 70 years. more and more people. Yeah, losing more and more people. Those guys that are 60, 70 years yeah, old. old that don't want to hunt anymore, well, only one out of every one um, has like a son that maybe doesn't even want to hunt or they didn't have any kids or they didn't get anybody else interested in the sport because at that point in time, everybody was interested. So they didn't want any more people out there hunting. So now we're, we're losing that and we just need to get more people out there. But again, also, I don't want to see more people pull up to my duck spot either. So. It's, right. it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, it's, um, it really is. Um, one thing I will say, even if you do have private land, it still doesn't always go well. Um, I'll say, um, you know, a story from last year. Um, we all have a mutual friend, Kudela. 
Um, you know, Dakota's hunted with him multiple times. Uh, I contacted him last year. Uh, we tried to get everybody here, but schedules didn't mix, but um, was able to get him out for a field out there where I live um, that had several, I'd say, several hundred geese hitting it. Uh, the night before, we had snow on the ground, and there was a big snowstorm coming the next day. Um, we went out and uh, put all this work in. Um, my buddy Casey went with us, not my brother Casey, uh, a friend of mine named Casey. He went out. Um, morning cracks, 9 o'clock rolls around, haven't seen nothing, haven't seen nothing. Four geese come in, um, I mean, um, Codella um, mopped them up. Casey was actually in the woods trying to take that morning deuce, which uh, as duck hunters, you know if you drink coffee in the morning, you got that mid-morning crap where you know if as soon as you go, ducks or, or geese are going to show up. Exactly. And so unfortunately, he missed out on that. But we cleaned out the four pretty quick. And all day, we were just sitting there waiting for these birds to come. We're like, where are they? Where are they? Well, lunchtime rolls around. We go to the local diner, get some food, and we drive around. And I'm hunting a field not too far away from a reservoir. And they come off the reservoir in the morning, go out to feed in the fields. Well, the wind and snow was so bad, they literally got out of the reservoir jumped the woods and just landed in this one field where actually I did have permission but it was a bean field and they were all just sitting there with their heads under their wings just sleeping they weren't I mean so there that goes to show you even though the night before there may have been hundreds or thousands in there something can always still go wrong and don't get discouraged if that happens I mean you do the best you can you try to read the elements you know everything pointed toward they should have been there that morning but you know, sometimes it just doesn't go according to plan, and you know that stuff happens. So just roll with the punches. Don't get discouraged. And ducks and geese, um, geese aren't hard to shoot, but ducks can be challenging. Um, you know, it's kind of funny where I had one kid that I kind of got into duck hunting. He told me, "Oh man, I can shoot. I can shoot." I'm like, "All right, we'll see." Wood ducks buzz real fast, and so did teal. And got him out there in the marsh, and uh, he didn't hit jack squat, though he practiced skeet and all that stuff because ducks dip and dive, and they're hard to hit sometimes. Um, so practice. Um, dove hunting's a good warm up. You know that's kind of what I do in the early season before duck season comes up. Kind of gets you ready. Um, but just practice and don't get discouraged because it's it's a long road. But I'd say I'd say the greatest feeling in the world is having a dozen mallards cup super hard just pouring into your spread. I mean I get probably more pumped up about killing a limit of ducks that did it right than shooting a a 10 point buck and I mean that's hard for a lot of people to relate but if ducks are working and you're cracking them there is no better feeling in the world mm. especially for all that hard work that you do trying to get stuff to pay off I guess my final thing goes along with with Charles is said just stay out there again w think about the reason why you're out there for you're out there to enjoy nature and we are out there to kill ducks too but enjoy the time while you're out there it's definitely a different set of experiences not everybody gets to hear the mallards quacking in the marsh behind you in the morning um it's just it's a cool experience go at least once in your life um you won't regret it absolutely well guys i think we're gonna pretty much close that out for uh today um zach you got anything to say before we close out this episode no no nope, right. i appreciate you guys having me on here and i absolutely. look forward to being on here in the future and making some some duck hunting videos absolutely so. we're gonna we're gonna make a big effort this year to get into some good drawings and uh we're gonna run some tack cams and some other cameras try to get some good duck footage on here and i know dakota is going to be a big part of that so we look forward to bringing you guys some waterfowl footage here in the fall thanks again for listening guys like subscribe check us out on youtube instagram leave comments likes i mean that all means a lot in promoting the brand we appreciate you i'm chaw i'm zach I'm Dakota. And we're the Ohio Boys. Thanks for joining us today, guys.